so again, thank you to DU for the opportunity to speak. Uh, so again, I'm with uh, FP Innovation. So just to give you a little bit of framework on sort of to help to define some of the information I'll provide in this presentation is uh, FP Innovations, we do research and development work for the forest sector uh, in Canada. So the forest sector can be a member of our organization. Um, so it includes forest industry, provincial and federal governments. So uh, we do a lot of work. We represent about 80% of the forest industry uh, in the country and we're a not-for-profit uh, private uh, research institute. So I'm based in our office in Montreal and my colleague uh, Clayton Gillies, who will speak in the concurrent session, is here as well and he's based in our office in Vancouver. So we mentioned some of the issues, uh, building roads across wetlands and some of the other presentations earlier this morning. So some of the items that I'll discuss as well will sort of reiterate some of those issues um, and as well as some of the knowledge gaps and research needs on identifying BMPs for building roads and wetlands going forward. And certainly part of sort of the recognition of doing this work is that as we work at the national level across the country, mainly with the forest sector, there's a wide range of awareness and interest in this topic. So certainly very high interest in Alberta on this topic from many sectors, but to have this similar type event in another province could be a challenge since the issue hasn't quite risen up to the level where it's become a, an issue that many sectors, governments and industry are, are uh, considering. So certainly building roads across wetlands, and it's only recently we started to call them wetlands. Up until very recently, they were lowlands, they were muskegs, they were non-productive areas, many other, many other terms. So for the forest sector, principally, a lot of these wetlands, what we're calling wetlands now, are areas where trees are growing. These are merchantable areas, these are stands that are scheduled for harvest, uh, especially for conifer swamps, that we need to operate in. But other wetland systems, such as bogs and fens, there's no trees. We want to avoid those as much as possible. There's no product of value within those systems. So Chris had mentioned this as well. So certainly poor bearing capacity, um, both for the road and, of course, linked to infrastructure as well. So for culverts or bridges, is a principal challenge. So soil, so engineering or building a road to meet the challenges of the soil, that's something we can do. And we can do now, the knowledge exists, but how to incorporate what we now recognize as a hydrology of the wetlands into this framework, into this decision process, that's, a, that's an additional challenge, an additional way to think about the issue. So the soil is a challenge, but recognizing that water is the enemy is how we need to build our roads and consider our infrastructure on these, uh, on these road systems. And a good example of this is that picture on the lower right, that's a uh, conifer swamp system in uh, northeastern Ontario. So this is all black spruce, this is all a harvested area, area that will be scheduled for harvest. So this is their standard practice now on how to build a road. So you uh, cut the trees down, leave the stumps, flip the stumps over, and in order to build up the subgrade of the road, they scrape off the sort of coarse woody material, the stumps and the brush from beside the road, pile it up in the center line of the road, and blade it out and build the road up over the sort of natural forest floor level. Well, when they do that, they're unintentionally creating a ditch. And now, with increased awareness on wetlands, how is that road interacting with that conifer swamp system? Is the road now draining, bringing water to the road? So now we're negatively, possibly negatively impact the wetland, but also not doing our road any favors as well. So part of the efforts in moving forward with this topic is sort of bringing some information to change the decision process and what was sort of typical sort of historical practices and integrating new, uh, new knowledge and new awareness on how we can improve those, improve those systems. And specifically with resource roads and most of my experience and our efforts is related to the forest sector is low cost. Our product is not worth that much so we can't spend hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars on a road in order to reach the areas in which we need to work. So we need to effectively build our roads at a low cost. So we can build our roads, but once we have our roads constructed and we're operating on them, either during the operation or during the construction period, we can also implement some other practices in which to alleviate some of the concerns. So that includes adapting our, adapting our equipment that might work on the site, such as using tire pressure control systems on our log trucks, 
or using wider tires with greater footprints on, say for example, on a gravel truck. So the folks from uh, Landmark provided a great presentation on sort of the engineering design and using geosynthetics and geoengineering for road design. But even at the lowest grade of road, geosynthetics can provide a great benefit for the structural design of the road. And Paul, in his presentation from Louisiana Pacific, also showed that example as well. So as it is with many other items in using the tool, uh, the challenges with using that tool is not the product itself, it's how it's implemented and how it's used. So there's many type of different types of geosynthetics. There's woven geosynthetics and there's non-woven and there's geogrids and uh, there's uh, geocells. So understanding how those different geosynthetics function and where they're appropriate for use is critical for proper implementation and proper performance of the road and of the design. So recognizing that some geotextiles are for uh, separation. So for example, Paul had showed the example of using the geosynthetic to provide separation between the road fill and for the underlying corduroy. So recognizing that, that you want to use it for separation and not for structural reinforcement will help guide you to understand what type of geosynthetic do I need to use. And that type of geosynthetic and change in that decision can have a big impact on your actual cost and some of your installation procedures. And so with many of these geosynthetics, there's a wide range of costs. You can get, especially now, there's products coming from China that are flooding the market that are significantly cheaper than some of the previous products. Uh, another example of that, those of you are familiar with it, uh, there's GeoGrid, which is the picture on uh, the second from the right. So you use GeoGrid for reinforcement. So you, if you're familiar with it, you know there's GeoGrid with square, shell, square openings, looks like a snow fence. And there's a new product on the market that has triangular uh, openings. The triangular openings in response to the patent running out on the square-shaped openings, so Chinese manufacturers flooding the market. So suppliers and designers come up with a new product to sort of meet the needs as well for, for that sector. And each type of geosynthetic has a different application. And speaking of the forest sector, we could build roads using geocell. That adds significant uh, structural performance. We compare that with a sand and with an underlying uh, woven geotextile, but just for the product alone, the cost for the product for a kilometer road could easily be $100,000 to $200,000 per kilometer, depending on the type, type and the size of a road. And for the forest sector, that's for many instances, that's going to be cost prohibitive. So we need to look at other solutions that may exist that may be more cost effective for implementation. And again, of course, corduroy, corduroy widely, uh, widely known, widely uh, used uh, across the country. And as well with many of these options and many of these solutions is thinking not just at the time of road construction, but what is uh, longer term service life and the life cycle analysis for that road. So is this a temporary road? Is it a permanent road? And how you build the road, are you going to be able to recover the materials and decommission the road either partially or completely after after uh, after use. So do, whether you're using a corduroy or whether you use a geosynthetic, that could imply different uh, 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 different responses during deactivation that you may need to uh, implement. And of course, we'll have a, a cost uh, a cost factor as well. So another example from Ontario, standard uh, corduroy road. Uh, so this is a wetland system. The cor road is corduroyed in the winter, um, used temporarily for access during the winter months. Now this temporary road will be converted into a permanent road, uh, and so the road will built, was built uh, prior to this. So you can see in this situation, they use corduroy for foundation improvement for structural design uh, for the road, but really the flow and the hydrology of the wetland is not considered. So how is this road going to react and influence the wetland over the long term now that it's going to be turned into a permanent road? And some, so a lot of my sort of brief presentation this morning, I'll talk more about the structural design and sort of keeping your road from falling into the wetland, whereas this afternoon in the concurrent session, my colleague Clayton will speak more of the sort of water flow and the water passage of uh, considerations with road construction. And again, as part of creating best practices or documenting best practices, we discussed this at a couple of the tables yesterday, it's just simply recording and documenting some of the basic practices now and some of those practices may seem basic to one area or one sector, but may not have been considered by another sector at all. 
So recording even some of those basic sort of thoughts and those basic practices is important to further evolve the development and the refinement of BNPs. So such things as, uh, you know, for a long-term road, ensuring that the corduroy is completely covered so that rot is not uh, permitted to occur and ensures that the corduroy uh, will function uh, on the long term. Not an issue for a short-term temporary road. If you don't want to cover up the ends, then great. And as well, when you're building a your road, ensuring as much as possible that the logs fully extend the width of the road, um, as well as an important consideration to uh, allow for that bearing capacity. Because we've seen other issues where shorter logs have been used, sort of meeting in the middle to meet the, the width of the road, but over time the road starts to sink, then the corduroy gets pushed out from the edge of the road and starts to stick up uh, at an angle from outside the road. And those issues, the corduroy is too small, and it's not long enough to fully span the, the width of the road. Again, if we, in order to ensure that our roads function properly in a wetland environment where there's low soil bearing capacity, we can design our roads to ensure that they flow, so through structural design, but we can also reduce the static loads of the, re of static loads of the road by reducing the weight of the road itself. So one of those is uh, lightweight fill. We've seen uh, some discussion on this uh, before. Not uh, big knowledge of this practice or any availability of this practice outside of Alberta. So in some provinces, bringing this topic up is new to them, and they're not, they wouldn't even know where to start and how to source the material. Uh, so that's uh, an example of the difference in knowledge and awareness uh, across the country. And uh, landmark, I mentioned the use of EPS or, or foam blocks. Typically in forest sector or resource road sector, the cost for using EPS blocks or geofoam can be quite high and the transportation, transportation uh, cost can be significantly high. But there's certainly instances where the lightweight fill has been used as fill behind the bridge abutment. So if you're building a road where you have high fills over uh, soil with poor bearing capacity, the light weight of the foam uh, reduces the static load on the, on the road and improves the flotation of the road. So certainly examples that across the country and in the forest sector where the foam blocks have been used for backfill. And that is a practice that is coming sort of increasingly common in the civil engineering, so for highway construction, municipal road construction. Uh, this is not a new idea for, for many of those folks. Again, another example of something that's very common in Alberta but not elsewhere is the use of mats. And if you were here for the sat uh, yesterday evening's presentation, Bev provided a good overview of some of the basic considerations and concerns and suggestions on how to uh, uh, use matting. So of course that's very common in Alberta, mainly because of the oil and gas sector, but in other parts of the country, there's no mats. If you want to get a mat, you wouldn't even know who to call up. So typically that's what I say, but in the, la in the last five, six months, the forest companies are getting marketing calls from mat companies from Alberta who now have a extra stock and are trying to sell their stock in other parts of the country. So, hey, we got some mats, do you think we could come and try it? So, with that, we may start to see more applications of mats in not only the forest sector, but other sectors as well in other parts of the country. So as we move to more understanding of wetland hydrology and the fact that we need to pair our road designs with our knowledge of wetlands, and Chris summarized that well in his presentation in that it's not so important for us to know if it's a bog, if it's a fen, or if it's a conifer swamp. What we need to recognize is how's the water moving within that wetland? Is it moving up and down? Is it stagnant? Do we have lateral flows? And what times of year should we expect that to occur? So up until very recently, that, that was a new, that's a new concept. And until very recently, to interact or to implement that process would be very difficult because the knowledge and awareness of wetlands doesn't exist or did not exist and the tools to evaluate that and implement that also did not exist. So some of the tools such as uh, the wetland classification system that uh, Chris uh, introduced, other tools such as wet areas mapping, uh, the increased use and availability of LIDAR to have uh, detailed digital elevation maps really has jumped ahead the, the knowledge level and the ability to implement some of these mapping tools. And now that we're thinking about wetlands and we're thinking about roads may have an impact on wetlands, we're not always doing this just to be a nice guy. There's reasons why we're thinking about this. We're thinking of this because policies are being enacted or being developed. Certainly Alberta is a great example of that. 
but other provinces as well, Manitoba, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, they have all either come out with policies in recent years or are, or are developing policies. And in some of these provinces, developing this policy is not the fact of, is not an issue of refining an existing policy, but really is implementing a new policy altogether. So there's a very steep learning curve in some of these provinces to have these sectors recognize that this is now a policy that needs to be considered. So in some of these provinces, thinking of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, there was significant pushback and significant refinement and debate about the implementation of the wetland policy and how that policy applies to different sectors. So there's a compensation uh, issue that applies to residential commercial development. Can that same type of compensation discussion be applied to the forest sector and should it be? So there was significant uh, amount of debate uh, on that. And as well, of course, in the forest sector, we have uh, forest certification systems. Canada is the world leader in sustainable forest management. So the three different forest certification standards, every company has at least one of these certification systems. They all, under their revisions, or under revision, or their recent standard revisions, have all incorporated increased awareness and increased requirement to protect uh, and consider wetlands to some degree. So both from the government regulatory issue, but also to the independent forest certification systems, wetland consideration uh, is out there. Now that we start to think about the wetland hydrology, maybe we're already, we had been aware of it, but never recognized that it may be important. So we've probably all driven down roads at some point and see that one side of the road, uh, trees are dead, uh, they have less health, but the other side of the road, everything seems fine. So now that there's an increased awareness that this is an issue that needs to be considered, we can start to integrate that hydrology and that wetland needs into our resource roads. And so I think that's an important component that recognizes some of the knowledge gaps that exist here is that we can state that roads may have an impact, uh, there may be a long-term impact, it may be important or not. So there's a lot of mays in these statements, so which influence how we develop and move forward with best management practices. Because generally speaking, we being the broader we, there's not a wide ranging database of scientific literature that indicates this type of road, this type of activity will negatively impact this type of wetland at this time and in this way. That information is starting to be developed, but there's not a lot of that knowledge that exists historically so that we can easily implement best practices as we move forward. So another example of understanding wetland hydrology and why it's important. This is another picture from Ontario. So this is a conifer swamp, similar to the overhead picture I showed earlier. So after a few days of heavy rain, we have the picture on the left. Okay, the, the ditch, the unintended ditch is starting to fill with water. Then three, four hours later in the afternoon, now that road is flooded. So this is a conifer swamp system, so at the time of building the road, they've considered, okay, I need to build the road simply so the road doesn't sink. Well, what sort of circumstances or how do we integrate the knowledge of how the water moves in this system and how can that influence how we build this road? Does it influence what time of year we build it? Does it influence how we build it? Maybe we don't put these unintended ditches in the road anymore and we need to allow sort of some water passage. And the water that's on sites like this, is it moving up and down? Is, it, is there lateral flow? How do we consider that into, uh, into our systems? So as we move forward, we both need to, re we need to recognize that forest road designs need to incorporate and recognize wetland hydrology to improve the structural design and the long-term performance of our roads. But we also need to recognize that roads may have an impact on wetlands, so the knowledge of the wetland hydrology can help to improve our uh, construction and uh, wetland practices. So part of that, uh, part of those efforts is uh, recent years, since uh, around 2010, our, the forest industry that's members of our organization had indicated that this was an emerging issue that uh, needs to be part of our research program. So integrating some more knowledge and awareness and activities that help to build some of the capacity on recognizing, recognizing the impacts and the uh, the link between building roads and wetlands needed to, needed to occur. So we had various reports, various work both on our own and also as many other speakers have indicated sort of these partnerships and collaborative projects uh, uh, are very important as well. And of course Chris had uh, indicated some of those with the operational guide and the schematics on how to build uh, uh, some of those uh, wetland crossings as well. 
as well to start to start to build up some of the capacity on how do wetlands react on the long term to, for road construction. So this particular example is one of our studies. Is this is a class one road uh, with Alpac in uh, northern Alberta. So it was built a few years ago. So since the time of construction, we've been doing elevation surveys on the road and on the culverts to see how the road reacts um, on an annual basis, so how much settlement is occurring both in the road and the infrastructure, but also as well as starting to implement some uh, remote sensing uh, technologies, aerial, aerial drone uh, imagery and satellite imagery to pick up those changes in tree health, pick up those changes in tree height, but also in soil moisture levels on the long term. So the advantage is using satellite imagery, we can go back before the road was built and at the time of construction and say, okay, what are, using the, uh, using the technology, what type of soil and moisture profiles do we see at the site before the road was constructed? Then we can return on a two, five, ten year basis with that same imagery and look at how the road, uh, road reacts as well. So all that information and all that work is starting to come together now on uh, come to completion of uh, National Field Guide for building our roads uh, in wetlands. So again, an important and great example of a collaborative uh, research effort. Uh, so FP Innovation and Ducks Unlimited are the main, uh, main partners in the project. But as well, we have project partners and review committee as well that are part of this initiative to uh, help review the documentation and help provide some guidance on the direction of developing this type of field guide and what type of information needs to be included. So as I think Chris mentioned in his presentation, so this guide will be out uh, in a couple months. Uh, it's currently in near to final draft form. So certainly by the summer it'll be widely available. So it'll be intended for field practitioners, so uh, tenant the basics of best management practices, the basics of what are some of the standard practices and what are the considerations uh, for their use. Um, so following the release of that document, then there'll be lots of opportunity for training, workshops, and uh, webinars. Uh, that'll occur, that'll start to get rolled out uh, later this summer and into the fall. So if that's something you're interested in, you can let myself or uh, my colleague Clayton know if, it's, if that's something you want us to follow up on. And again, throughout, this, uh, throughout these initiatives for, as Chris mentioned as well, for starting to build this knowledge on wetlands and uh, roads, SFI, the uh, certification system has been an important partner in providing some funding for that work. So there's been work activity as Chris outlined in Manitoba, Saskatchewan. There's a research project in Atlanta, Canada, looking at the impacts on roads, on wetlands and Acadian forest types, and as well as support for this uh, sort of national field guide. So just in summary, so as we develop and move forward with uh, best management practices, we recognize there's lots of knowledge gaps that exist. There's not a lot of information. However, we need to start taking that basic information that exists and start compiling it and recognize that these are some of the practices that exist now. Provide that recognition so as we move forward, we can start to evaluate and improve on those. And of course, doing those best management practices has both an impact and importance for protection and mitigating impacts on the wetlands, but also there can be significant operational advantages through reduced road maintenance, uh, more long-term use of the road, higher traffic speeds, safety, so many other issues that has both an economic uh, economic advantage as well.